Hi there. Hi. Thanks for coming out today. This is really a great event that's being put on, and I'm very appreciative of, of being invited. So my name is Mark Bluestone, and I own a company by the name of Smart House, Home Performance Experts. We are a home performance contractor, so that's kind of a new breed of, of home help for you. That uh, We do everything related to energy efficiency and comfort in your home. Uh, so we go out and do energy audits in people's homes to help them figure out ways that they can become more energy efficient. We uh, do insulation, we do air sealing, we're a licensed mechanical contractor, so we do heating and cooling and ventilation. So really, if, it, if it's energy efficiency and comfort, we're there. Uh, but I'm really not here to sell you anything today. I'm here to talk about how you can save s some money in your homes and live more comfortably and more efficiently. Many of the things I'm going to talk about are things that you can kind of take responsibility for yourselves in your house. And there's going to be uh, some other things that you um, you will need some help with. You know, obviously, we hope you'll like us and favor us with your business. But uh, I'm just here to kind of share the information and hopefully uh, give you guys something good to take home. So. When I think about saving energy in a house, it's an awfully daunting task. How do I save energy? And you normally think about, you know, maybe one or two things you can do or something you saw on HGTV or something like that, but I'm kind of a more maybe a, a plan-oriented kind of person. So what I like to do is before I figure out how I'm going to save energy, I want to know where I spend money on energy. Where do I use my energy? So essentially, when you break up your energy use in a house, you've got about 29% of your money goes to heating your house. And you've got about 17% of your money goes to cooling your house. So it's at 42%, 46%, very close to 50%. Almost half of your Ameren and, and the Cleve bills are going to heating and cooling your house. So obviously, that's a, a really big deal. Um, you're spending a lot of money on water heating, probably about 14% of your money on water heating. You're spending a bunch of money on appliances, probably about 13%. Lighting, probably about 12%. And bringing up the rear or your electronics and all that other stuff that you have going on in your house. So when I look at this, this tells me that if I can come up with ways to affect my heating and my cooling, my water heating, my appliances, and my lighting, just something for each of those things, doesn't have to be dramatic, doesn't have to be expensive, but if I can take baby steps and address each one, then overall I'm gonna get a benefit. There's all kind of research that shows doing one thing does almost nothing. It's typically you've got to do multiple things to bring about the effect that you want. And when you think about why houses are energy hogs or why they're not comfortable, drafts, cold floors, that kind of stuff, it's almost never one thing. People think, oh, I need insulation because we're trained as, as homeowners to think that's what we need. We need insulation. But you know, you can have drafts because of air leaks that insulation don't, doesn't stop. You can have all kinds of issues kind of weaving their way into that. So we find normally that a solution, whether it's energy use or comfort, normally is two or three or four things, most likely closer to four than two. So that's where your money is going. And then for each of these critical areas, we're going to run down, so this is kind of a little preview, what some of the things you can do would be. So for heating and cooling, obviously one of the things you can do is adjust your temperature settings. Another thing you could do is think about a programmable thermostat, because if you're out at work all day, why does your house have to be comfortable as if you're home? Uh, certainly the maintenance of your equipment, and it, when it comes time to buy a new system, you've got to think about the efficiency of the equipment you're buying. Uh, there's people who make the mistake of buying the cheapest, cheapest, cheapest system, but they end up paying that money back many times over, because this stuff lasts 15, 20 years. So if you save $500, but you burn another $4,000 in energy, that's 3500 bucks that you could have invested. And if your money doubles every eight years in your investment, that's $3,500. That would have been how much? Eight, nine, ten thousand dollars at the end if you if you had invested. So there's big differences. Uh, building shell, insulation, air sealing, windows. For water heating, we'll talk about your consumption habits, how the water gets where it needs to go and gets onto your body when you're showering, for example. We're going to talk about energy saving light bulbs and appliances. So it's really going to run a big a big range of topics. So let's start with lighting. The number one lighting tip I have for you is say goodbye to your incandescent light bulbs. Uh, the government's making you say goodbye because you can't manufacture most incandescent light bulbs anymore. And in the future, there's going to be fewer and fewer of them. But incandescent, incandescent light bulbs basically are little heaters. They work on the same principle as your toaster. 
you know, when you push down on the thing to make your bread toasted, what happens inside the toaster? It lights up, right? You've got all those filaments that are consuming electric and they're lighting up. And what are they also doing in addition to making light? Heat. Making heat, right? So incandescent light bulbs, horribly, terribly inefficient. So you have some choices. The very top, you see the compact fluorescents. And those are, I believe, what Amarin is being good enough to, to give out today. Wonderful light bulbs, kind of really the first very efficient or more efficient choice for, for light bulbs. Uh, many people love them. They've got a lot of benefits going for them. They use a lot less watts, so watts is your energy, to make the same number of lumens. Lumens is the amount of light. So they're much more efficient is basically what you would say. But they have some negatives that are getting solved with newer generation light bulbs. One of them, what's a negative on, an, on a um, CFL or a bulb? Color, yeah, so color sometimes, and I'm going to try to help you a little bit with that, but color sometimes isn't what you want it to be. It's too blue or it's too white, maybe. Another thing people get frustrated with is they don't turn on right away. There's, some of them do, but there's a lot of the bulbs that you turn it on, you get about maybe 40 or 50% of your light output right away, and then over the next few minutes, it comes on even more, right? Which is not a big deal, I guess, if it's the light in the kitchen and it's going to be on for the next three hours, but it is a pretty big deal if you put it in your your closet or your master bath and you just want to run in there and you know brush your teeth or something but you have no light so that that's that's a big thing okay the kind of the follow-on to the compact fluorescent bulb is the LED bulb so an LED bulb is a, a more sophisticated type of low cost low energy using bulb they run a lot cooler than uh, incandescent bulbs do and uh, they have the benefit of coming right on the minute you flip it on it goes on they have the benefit of being very dimmable. If you have dimmers in your house, you can purchase ones that say dimmable on it. If they don't say dimmable, who wants to guess? Are they dimmable? No. no. <laughs> so, you know, you got to buy one that says dimmable if you want it to dim. But, uh, and these guys are looking like regular light bulbs. And they're coming down. So when Cree introduced this at Home Depot, I think they were like $20 when they first came out. And they were like a miracle. But this is long, long ago. I mean, you're talking... Wow, way back in 2013. Right? <laughs> and now they've gone from $20 to, I believe this bulb right now is like either, there's the 40 watt is 497 and the 60 watt is just a few dollars more. So they've really come down. But here's the cool thing. It puts out 800 lumens, which is what a 60 watt light bulb puts out, but it uses 9.5 watts. Mm. So think about that. Let's say you have a kitchen with six lights in it, and every one of your light bulbs in there uses, um, well, just make the math easy. Let's say they use 60 watts a piece, mm -hmm. right? So you have 360 watts to light those six lights. If, you, if these are only, let's call it um, nine and a half watts, let's call it 10 watts. If you replaced each of those six bulbs with one of these at 10 watts, you're using 60 watts. You're using the energy of, of, of one of those six energy consuming bulbs to to make your room light, right? Mm -hmm. The other five, it's like they're not even there, yet you have just as much light. Mm -hmm. So it's a really great option. Uh, they come in all these standard kinds of replacement bulbs. They're starting to come in like candelabra type bulbs for over your, your dining room table. And you can replace recess lights. They make this really nice unit. Home Depot sells them. I love Home Depot's selection of LED bulbs. They don't pay me any money to say that. I've bought every single light bulb out there. I mean, you know, light bulb geek extraordinaire. But um, I've tried them all. Home Depot has a great selection. And one of the cool things is they're quality manufactured. They're made by a company called Cree, which is a company that engineers the power supply to work with the diode. One of the problems is if the bulb is mismatched, like a cheapy, cheapy promotional kind of bulb, they're, they're not matched electronically inside the light. They don't last as long, they don't look as good, they don't work as well. Okay? But you can replace even recessed lights with the um, reflector type bulbs, with better bulbs. Here's the key for you to remember. In the old days, you would shop for light bulbs by watts. You would just go in and buy the number of watts. Now you shop for light bulbs by lumens and by color temperature. Mm -hmm. If you like soft white light, it's almost like a little yellowy kind of light, you know, it's just really nice and soft and smooth, you want 2700 Kelvin. As you get higher and start to get up into the fours, 
um, and higher than that even, they become more daylight oriented bulbs. And daylight sounds really attractive to me. Like who wouldn't want to be bathed in daylight in their kitchen, right? I mean, that's kind of cool. You spend a lot of money and you put in skylights to do it. But the reality is it's bluish white. And a lot of people, you ever drive down a street in a beautiful kind of historic neighborhood and then there's this one oddball house that has this bright bluish white light that just doesn't fit? That's because they have a high color temperature. If you went at 2700, you would have a soft white light. So that's important. And then lumens, you just want to match it up with the bulb that you have now. On the back of every light bulb, you've got a little like a lighting fats box. It's just like the nutrition fats box, except instead of telling you fat and carbohydrates and calories, it's telling you lumens and color temperature. But it's a standardized type of thing, so you want to get your information from there. Okay? I should move along or else I'm going to run out of time. So, let's move on to appliances now. So we kind of covered lights. Anybody have a quick question on lights or are we good? Yes? I have an, I inherited an old uh, crystal uh, lamp. Mm -hmm. It's a three-way. I noticed these things don't come in three ways, and then I have the light that was, was I was using security light. Right. I guess the the bulb burned out. I don't know. Yeah. And I tried to put one of those in, and it it doesn't come on. Right. Well, a lot of the time, if you put a one-way bulb into a three-way socket, it'll light up on the middle setting mm -hmm. if you click it twice. There are compact fluorescent bulbs that come as three-way bulbs. Mm -hmm. um, there are the LEDs are only just starting to be contemplated. For, for that application. And the problem with the compact fluorescent three-way bulb is they're physically large mm -hmm. and they don't fit correctly for a lot of them. So give it a little while and, and I think we'll, we'll get there. Yes? I just wanted to know if the color temperature affected the lumens or the, the wattage or anything for just a preference. I, I think it's um, it, it, it's largely independent. I mean, I suppose it's possible that there's a few more lumens either way depending on the color temperature, but really they're, they're two separate things. How bright, what color? Good question. Yes. What's the color temperature of the old incandescent light? Very close to twenty. Very close to twenty-seven hundred. Okay. So the twenty-seven hundred is a direct AB replacement. Okay. Well, excellent question. Let's talk about appliances. When it comes time to replace your appliances, think about Energy Star. Energy Star is one of the most powerful brands in the world, and it's owned by our government. Go figure. <laughs> but Energy Star stands for appliances, for houses, for equipment, for all kinds of things that do the work you need done the same way as all the other appliances, but they do it more efficiently. They use less energy. So for example, jump to a refrigerator. An Energy Star refrigerator on average uses about $10 per month less electric than a non-Energy Star refrigerator. And if you're replacing a really old non-Energy Star refrigerator, that's a big deal. The added cost is paid back for pretty quickly and it has a dramatic effect on your energy bill. So really think through um, maybe spending that little bit more mon money to get the Energy Star appliance. There's also sales, I think once or twice a year, where you don't pay sales tax when you buy an Energy Star appliance, which covers a lot of the, the added money you're paying for the more efficient appliance. Warning though, a lot of people buy refrigerators and then what do they do with the old one? They stick it in the garage and they fill it with beer, right? It uses just as much electric when you do that as it did when it was in your kitchen. And then you're actually having a net increase. So Aaron would love to come take your refrigerator away. And that's probably the smart thing to do. So, dishwashers. Dishwashers use about 10%, an Energy Star dishwasher uses about 10% less energy than a standard one, but they use about 1,900 gallons of water less. And if they're using hot water, what are they also using less of? Yeah. Gas or whatever energy you use to heat your water. So a, um, a dishwasher, Energy Star, is a money and energy and planet improving bonanza. Okay? <laughs> and totally more effective than doing dishes by hand. Okay? There's a lot of people who think they can do their dishes better by hand, that they're going to be cleaner and that they're going to use less energy and less water and all that stuff. No. Nah. Done the tests over and over again. It's been done all over the country. Almost nobody can beat a good dishwasher. So it's, it's something to, to really think about. <laughs> ceiling, ceiling fans, the, uh, the motors and ceiling fans can be Energy Star rated. They'll use less energy than non-Energy Star rated. And also washing machines. Washing machines use less energy for the motors, and they also use less water. Uh, and with most of the detergents out there today, you can, you can use cold water and get a, a, a real good result. So it's just, just wonderful stuff. Uh, dryers don't come with an Energy Star rating because what dryers do is they just 
burn energy, electric or gas, to make hot. And it's just, you also can't get stoves that are energy star rated. So, but yeah, maybe some of that stuff will be coming. They figured out, who knows. Let's talk about water. The key determining factor here is how long is your shower, okay? The longer your shower is, obviously the more water you use, which is not good for the world. The more energy you, you use at the, the treatment plant, which is not good for the world. Uh, you're also consuming more gas in your house to make your water hot. So showers are, are very, very inefficient, really. So what you want to do is you want to think about using a low flow shower head. So who's ever used a low flow shower head and just regretted it because there's not enough water pressure, there's not, remember the Seinfeld episode one time when the hair was just laying there mat because they couldn't get the soap out of it. There is a good low flow shower head that I will share with you. Again, nothing, I have no business arrange, arrangement with them. The brand is called Evolve and the model name is the Roadrunner. And this is a phenomenal shower head that I defy you to, fig to tell me that it's not as good as any other shower head. And I've tested it with my son. And he's a shower aficionado. And he thought I bought him an upgraded shower head. He was happy. Thank you for getting an upgraded shower head. It also has another feature. Whoever turns on their water and then waits and waits and waits for the hot water to come. So what do you do, right? I mean, during that time, you maybe you brush your teeth or you go downstairs to the kitchen or you go up to Schnucks and do your shopping. And whatever it is, then, then you come back and you finally have hot water, right? The Evolve shower head, uh, you probably can't really see it, but it has a little kind of a switch on it that it has a, a uh, device that measures temperature and then when the water gets hot inside that shower head, it shuts the water off to the shower. And then all you do to get the water flowing again, when you come back to it, is pull the cord and then it just starts flowing. And when you shut it off at the end of the shower, it resets. So it's a fabulous way, it uses a gallon and a half a minute. It's like nothing. You will save gas, you will save water, you will just save and you'll have a perfectly good shower. Okay? What's the name? What's the, name? The, oh. the brand is Evolve and the, um, the, the model number is the Roadrunner. The model name is the Roadrunner. Um, you can buy them online from the manufacturer for about 50 bucks or you could go on eBay and find loads of people selling them for probably 29 or 30 dollars. And that's what I've done, and they were genuine. I mean, it's cheaper than I can buy them from the distributor. So, but it's a quality product. It's nice. I mean, it's not a, it's not a plastic piece of junk. Um, washing clothes, of course, um, not hot water if you can help it, and dishwasher kind of covered that. But that's all ways to save water. And if you can save water, um, you're probably I know in the city you don't get you don't pay a separate water bill, but you do pay a gas bill, and that's a big deal in the county. You not, you not only pay a water bill, but you pay a sewer bill, which is tied to your water usage. So it's even more of an upside there. But, but no matter where you are, uh, you'll you use less gas for heating, and you'll help the planet. So I think that's good all the way around. Let's kind of shift modes now to keeping our house hot or cold. I'm talking so fast because it's like an hour and a half seminar that I'm doing in 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so heating and cooling. Um, the, the single best way, probably, to save energy without replacing your systems is not to have a programmable thermostat, believe it or not. It's to really? use your programmable <laughs> thermostat. If I had a dollar for every house that I go into or my guys go into on a daily basis that sees the programmable thermostat set to hold, mm -hmm. you know, I'd have a lot more dollars than I have now. But uh, I would recommend that you use it and you think through your schedule. Now, if you're home all day, it's maybe not as useful. If you have kids coming in and out of the house all day, maybe it's not as useful. But most people, I think, can kind of let, let it go back just a little bit and, and then make it warm up again before you get home or, or cool off again. Certainly what you could do is maybe sleep a couple of degrees cooler, you know? I mean, if you like your house at 67 degrees, 68 degrees during the day, maybe you can sleep at 65 degrees, knowing that it's set that, you know, a half hour before you wake up, it's gonna start heating up your, your house again for you and it won't be so cold. And they're really smart today. They don't start heating the house at the time you set, but they know how long it takes them to get, how long it takes your furnace to get your house warm again or cool again, and they start in advance so that it's hitting the target when you want it and you don't have to do the math. So programmable thermostats, pretty inexpensive too, way under 100 bucks. You can get Wi-Fi on them if you want to also, which is great. You can change your temperature from your smartphone. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of really cool features. You don't have to spend 300 bucks on a Nest thermostat. You can get a lot of really good thermostats for well under 100 bucks. So kind of think through that one. 
Another thing for heating and cooling, maintain your systems. We all hear the ads on the, the radio for a furnace check or anything like that. It's really a good thing to do. It's good, a good thing to do for a number of reasons. First of all, for both heating and for cooling, equipment that's clean and that's well maintained operates more efficiently and it operates for longer. There's no body questioning any of those things. As far as heating goes, it's also a safety issue. You have what's called a heat exchanger in your furnace. The heat exchanger is what separates the combustion gases, the, you know, the carbon monoxide sometimes and whatnot, from the air you breathe in your house. Heat exchangers, as systems get older, they can rust and they can crack, and you can have a combination of, of gases, and you don't want exhaust gases in your house. So it makes a lot of sense to have somebody look at that and figure it out and just make sure you're safe, okay? Heat exchangers crack because of age. They also crack if you turn off too many registers around your house. Who here like shuts off their registers in some of the rooms of the house and you get to the point where you, you want like half of the registers closed because you're gonna get more air at the other registers. Well, a lot of the time that doesn't really happen because when you're shutting your registers off in some rooms, your supplies, the pipe that goes to the other rooms isn't getting bigger. So there's a, a theoretical limit of how much air you can put through maybe a six inch duct, right? So you're really probably not getting a lot more air to the other places you're going to, but what you are doing is you're sending less air across the heat exchanger, and that air is cooling the heat exchanger, and your furnace can overheat that way, and it can cause it to crack. Normally, cracked heat exchanger is a cause of death for a furnace. It's not something that most people fix. So it's something, have some maintenance done, and in the cooling season, cooling season, have your maintenance done. Um, I just, I'll offer you guys, I mean, we'd love to come into your homes and help you. Uh, if you wanted to call Smart House in, we normally charge, depending on systems, between $69 and $89 for service checks. Uh, if you say you were here, talk to Stephanie when she answers the phone, say you were here, and I said this, because I'll forget to tell her. No, she'll, she'll know, I promise. Um, we'll come out and do a furnace check for you for $49. A licensed, bonded, insured technician, expert, that's what they do, will come in and check out your system and make sure you're doing safe. Okay, so I'd like to offer that. Yes. Uh, do you recommend the programmer um, thermostat for, um, I want to say, boiler heating? Um, boil uh, yeah. Radiator. Oh, radiator. Um, yeah, because it, it calls for different heat at different times. Anything which would call for different heat at different times could benefit by, by being set back. I mean, you could, if you turn down your regular thermostat to 65 degrees for, mm -hmm. you know, five hours when you were going to be out of the house, you'd use less energy. And the programmable would work exactly the same way. It's a great oh, question. Okay, thank you. Yes. So I'm just wondering, I've been to workshops before when they yeah, say yeah. you adjust the thermostat um, too high and too, oh, at different yeah. times, then you cause it to overwork when it's trying to catch up. You know, that's a really great point. So, and, and this is, and this is why it's hard to do all this in 25 minutes, mm -hmm. but um, it's a matter of degree. So the answer would be, what they're basically saying is, if, if let's say your house is not well insulated, and you turn your heat down, and you turn it down to 50 degrees, and your house, the insulation is so weak in your house that the house really does become 50 degrees over the, the six hours that, that you haven't been running your furnace, that's going to take a lot of energy to get your house back warm again. So I, I think my, my quick non-technical answer would be keep it mellow, right? So if you normally keep your house at 68 when you're in the house, Turn it back to 65, turn it back to 64. Take a modest savings. And really what a lot of your gain is, is not just that you're not heating it to such a warm temperature, but also the, the hour or more that it doesn't run at all while it's letting it itself get a little cooler. So I think if you keep it mellow, the same way you don't want to let it get up to 95 degrees in the summer, right? You want to maybe, if you keep your house 75, let it go up to 79 or something like that during the summer. Great question. Though. Okay. Now, we talked about service and maintenance. When it comes time to purchase new equipment, which we all have to do probably around every 20 years or so, then one of the things you want to think about is Energy Star. That same brand is there for you. It's there for furnaces and it's there for air conditioners. So Energy Star can give you much more advanced systems that in many cases can use 30, 35, 40 percent or more less energy. We see furnaces out there, um, the least efficient furnace you can buy today is 80 percent to use in your house, gas furnace, but we st still see furnaces out there that are 60 percent, that they were rated when they were new, who knows what they are today. And it, it, it is just as it sounds. For every dollar you send liquid gas with a 60 percent furnace, 
60 cents is helping heat your house, 40 cents is just blowing out of your house and helping heat the neighborhood. Okay? It's just not good use of your money, or it's being inefficient in any of a number of other ways. Um, yes. So you want a more efficient furnace. 80%, same thing. Using 80 cents, wasting 20. But tell me now about 95, 96%, which can be had for not a lot more money, and the fleet gas gives some rebates to help make it easier. Okay? Same thing with air conditioners. You can get air conditioners that are much more efficient than older air conditioners. Many of us at our houses have air conditioners, uh, their measured efficiency is measured as SEER, S-E-E-R. Many of us have air conditioners that are 8 SEER or 10 SEER. The, the least efficient you can buy today is 13, but you can get a very cost-effective 16 SEER air conditioner. And Ameren, for the most part, the rebate they pay for it is big enough to cover the effect, to cover the difference, the added cost of acquisition. So it's a phenomenal program that, that you want to think about taking advantage of when you get to that point. Okay. Now, building shell. So the building shell, and how many more minutes do I have? Just a few. That's just a few. Yeah, I just, did I start three or four more minutes. Okay. Five. 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 Great. Okay. Good. <laughs> ten more. I can do it in ten. Um, <laughs> so now, in terms of your building shell, this is the outside of your house. Okay. Mm -hmm. When we think of the outside of our house, we think of the windows and the walls and the and the, the roof, probably, right? And that would be sort of kind of right, except it's not entirely. When you think about the shell of your house, what you need to be thinking about is where is the border between inside and outside, right? So for the house, most, mostly it's the walls, and it's, the, um, it's the, the windows, and it's the doors, and it's the slab of your, of your basement if you have one, and it's the ceiling of, of your uppermost floor, that's pretty much. And you have two kinds of boundaries. You have an air boundary, so that separates the inside air from the outside air, and you have a thermal boundary that separates the inside temperature from the outside temperature. And what many houses do terribly is establish the boundaries because they have to be one boundary, one and the same. This is where the air stops. This is where we draw the line for where the temperature can go. They've got to be the same. And in a lot of houses, they're not. Okay? So what we have to do is get them to line up. And there's lots of places where houses leak air. And that's one of the big problems. Normally, air leaks into a house through the bottom and it leaks out of the house through the top. And if you have air leaking out of the house from the top, then you have air leaking in through the bottom because the inside air pressure of your house will almost always be the same as the outside air pressure. So if air could leak without air replacing it, then you, you know, when you turn the doorknob, your door would fly open because there was a vacuum inside. And that almost never happens. Okay? So that, that's something to, that, that you need to be thinking about. Okay? So it will always leak. So here's the implication of leaking. Implication of leaking is you've paid the clean gas money to make your air 70 degrees. And if you lose that air, it's almost like the air is being stolen. It's like being shoplifted. It's getting out of your house and it's gone. But what happens to every cubic foot of air? And by the way, you don't have just a few cubic feet. You have hundreds or thousands of cubic, air, cubic feet of air leaking every day. What happens when a cubic foot of air leaks out of your house on a 10 degree day? a cubic foot of air leaks into your house. Right. And on a 10 degree day, you lost 70 degree air. How, how, how warm or cold is the air that leaks in on a 10 degree day? 10 degrees. 10 degrees. Yeah. So now instead of your furnace having to reheat the 70 degree air that became 67 because it sat against your window for a while, it has to reheat 10 degree air. That sounds expensive to me. Mm -hmm. And it is. So that's why you want to seal air leaks. Goal, like we said, continuous air barrier. I'm almost done, I swear. Uh, I, I just want to kind of alert you to some common leak points in the house. So most every house has some things called chases. Chases are where pipes and, and electric and chimneys and all kinds of other stuff go vertically through the house. A lot of times, uh, if you have a, um, a four inch wide piece of metal, going, a pipe going up through your house to vent your, your furnace, perhaps, mm -hmm. a lot of the time there's a 12-inch square hole that the 4-inch pipe runs through, right? Mm -hmm. I've gone into houses and gone into the attic and taken a golf ball and dropped it down next to the piece of the metal exhaust pipe and heard it bouncing on the floor of the basement, mm -hmm. okay? That's pretty dramatic, because what's that telling you? Mm -hmm. That's telling you that the warm air that always wants to do what? Rise. Rise. Rise is going up around your vent up and out of your house. It's being shoplifted, it's being stolen, and it's being replaced by cold air that you have to go pay money to heat again. Okay? So making your house airtight is important, or more tight. 
When you call an insulation company and you ask them to blow a bunch of insulation into your attic, it doesn't stop air leaks 99% of the time. You'd have to get one of these like genius, special, advanced, caring people to mm -hmm. come and do that. Okay, usually it's going to be a building science company like us or a weatherization program or somebody who really understands this who's going to do it for you. In my opinion, insulation without air sealing for the most part is a waste. I think if I analyze most homes, I would say if you can't do both, stop the leaks first. Then a couple of years when you've saved up some money, go back and then you insulate, okay? And Laclede Gas, by the way, will loan you money to insulate. They'll loan it to you. I always get confused whether it's 3% or 3.5%, but it's cheap. Mm -hmm. And it's for seven and a half years. So $2,000 to make your house more efficient is $24.84 a month. That I can remember, but not the percentage. On your gas bill. And the idea is that it runs, that your gas bill goes down enough that your, your net effect, hopefully, somewhere near the same. Okay, so um, chases are an important thing where you have dropped ceilings. Sometimes you can have outside air between the regular ceiling and the rest. Window openings can be places where air mixes and you don't want it to. Plumbing penetrations, like where your spigot goes outside of your house, that can be a big deal. Um, duct work in your house, like if you have duct work in your attic, anybody have duct work in their attic? Well, if you have it, it leaks, probably. So your furnace is heating air, blowing it under pressure into your attic. It can be fixed. It's pretty cheap, too. But it can all be done, and you'll be crazy how much money it saves. You'll kill yourself that you haven't done it for so long. Um, access panels, like your attic hatch, places where air gets lost quite a lot. Ceiling fixtures, sill plates. It's like the piece of wood at the bottom of your house that sits on top of your foundation. Lots of air leaks there. Go home, take a flashlight, look around the bottom of your house where your foundation meets the rest of your house, and see the cobwebs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's a sign of an air leak, usually. Do, are you going to have a copy of that? Because you're going pretty Are you guys putting it online? Yeah, we can put it online. Okay. Yeah, I'm more than happy to give the, the presentation okay. that it can be put online. Yeah. Happy to do it. Or you can take one of my cards, give us a call, and I'll mail you one. Whatever I can do for you. Um, and then vents, ways that air get, get out, also get in. Very, very common. Uh, the way we check to see how much a house leaks is called a blower door test. It's a computerized fan. We depressurize the inside of the house, make it be a lower pressure than outside, and then using things like thermal cameras and smoke pencils and stuff, we're able to figure out where's all this air going, okay? Um, thermal cameras. The result is, very often, we're able to see that's a chase, like I talked about. The thing I dropped the golf ball down, mm -hmm. hot air running up and down through the wall of the house. That just looks like it's costing you money and comfort, doesn't it? And then the way you fix it is by having, in this case, you're hiring somebody to do it, and you're spraying foam. You're finding the leaks, you're getting in there, you're moving insulation out of the way, you're brushing it to make a nice surface, and you're spraying foam. And then only when you're done with the air sealing, do you blow your insulation? And there's a few other things, I'll actually mention this to you. If somebody says they are going to come air seal your house, but they're not going to do a combustion safety test, you don't want to walk, you want to run yeah. away from them, okay? Because what happens in a house, if, when a house gets tighter and tighter, then you can create a situation where when you do things like turn on dryer fans or range hoods or bathroom exhaust fans or any number of other things, you can actually cause your exhaust gases to get sucked back down your flue into your house as your house gets tighter because you're eliminating the other ways that air leaks in. Um, that makes it sound sort of dangerous. It's really not dangerous as long as it's done by competent people who care, right? So that's what you, you want to find. You want to find the, the right people to be able to help you with that. Um, I think I have covered that. Um, phone numbers there, business cards are back there. Um, I don't charge you to talk to you. I mean, if, if, um, you, if there's any way we can ever be helpful to you guys, we would really love to. And I just want to say the segue to solar now, because we're going to have straight up solar, is that whenever you think of solar, what makes solar really, really impressive is when you also make your house more efficient on the way in. Would you agree with that? Because if you can make your house use less energy, then the energy that you produce with the equipment that the solar guys create for you covers a bigger percentage of, of your house. So, Yay. you're up. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And before we let Mark go, Smart House generously donated a couple of students' prizes we today. We were, they had offered to give away one home we're giving energy a, We're audit. giving an energy evaluation where we'll come and we'll do the blower door test and the thermal camera and we'll 
look at your appliances and your lighting and your air leaks and we'll, we'll do all that for you and it's for free uh, for, for us to come look and we're also uh, giving a furnace tune-up so it's to a different person hopefully we can spread it out a little yeah bit, yeah we are typically how much does an uh, energy audit cost uh, normally two hundred dollars um, so why don't we draw numbers for that? Oh, great. Like Alice has our mm -hmm. master sheet, and we're going to say different winners than who won the Amlin gift cards earlier in the session. Um, all right, drum roll. Did that one? All right, number twenty. Did we already do twenty? Yeah. Did. All right, more drum roll. We didn't do enough of it. We need a better number. Fourteen. Fourteen is S. Wang. Jones, that person here. It's you. Yeah. I don't feel right taking. Well, it's kind of. You're here. It was open to everyone. Oh, you mean you're from St. Louis, just not from yeah. this neighborhood? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. All right, and one more. Twenty-two. Twenty-two is Gail Wheatley. Wheatley. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we all get some the furnace one and the home energy audit. That was the order in which he said. Unless you guys decide you want to swap. I just had the work done in my home by Urban League. Oh, good for you. And they did a great job. So I don't need it. Thank you. Okay. So we'll do one more. For the furnace. Yeah. 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 Well now, why <laughs> you're 16? No, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do it. All right, one more drum roll. We need louder drum rolls here. Nineteen. Nineteen. Nineteen is Patricia McQueen. Oh, thank you. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me. So we got one more present.